Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Our seventh session of our Women on the Rise series. Um, this is a nine part series. So we're almost to the end, which makes me a little sad, but also gives me some hope to get it going again next year. Um, we have an amazing lineup of um, presenters today, so I'll touch base on those, but a little bit about me. I'm a business advisor with the Small Business Development Center. It's actually Small Business Development uh, Center Day, so happy SBDC Day to everyone. Um, and I work with Lorraine Heinz. She's our regional director for the SBDC. And I also get to work with Leslie's husband, Kevin, uh, and he's also a business advisor and he runs our Rock 31 Entrepreneur Program. So um, we just have a really great team here. The great thing about the SBDC is our services are free. So we get to help you um, make your dreams come true and it's no cost to you, So, which is really awesome. When we heard about the crisis with women um, and the pandemic, we were like, how can we get something put together? And Karen was thinking the same exact thing. And so we got together and came up with this Women on the Ride series. So we're always, uh, we always have a great time partnering with Karen. And so we're just grateful to, to have her partnering with, with us on this today. Oh, well, I guess all nine sessions. <laughs> and Karen owns Canvas Creek um, team building. So she'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But about our amazing speakers today, we have Leslie with First Interstate Bank and Toby with KOA, and they're gonna be talking to you about um, you know, general hiring and recruiting and, and kind of what it, what it takes to you know, be a, a good leader and, and um, some of the things you wouldn't think about. So we'll go ahead and I'll throw it over to Karen to get us started. Great, you guys. Thank you for being here and Kayla for that great introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna show you just um, a couple of slides from um, a show that I do that's called uh, Quiet Leadership or a speech that I do called Quiet Leadership. And some of this comes from my book, What's Next? But the first slide, as you can see, I saw Denise's reaction to it. I think this is the very most important thing to remember about employees is that some people are like blisters. They only show up after the work is done. And our goal is never to hire a blister because if you hire or a blister, they are going to aggravate you every single day. So you want to be really careful that you are not hiring the blisters of the world. You also want to make sure that you are not the uh, blister of the world. While I have your attention, I'm going to tell you um, the story of my very best boss ever. I am hard to boss. I've been an entrepreneur since I was nine years old, but I did go into the corporate world so that I could learn how to coach people and, and learn more about the world, which, oh my gosh, I sure did. But when I was trying to figure out how to not be such a shy person, I realized that everything in the world was sales and probably the hardest thing I could sell and have the most growth was car sales. So I went into car sales in Alaska um, long enough ago that women didn't do that. I was quite the novelty. And I promptly starved to death. And then I learned about Saturn. The um, owner of our dealership started a Saturn dealership, which way back when Saturn was the first car that you didn't negotiate the price on. They changed everything about the industry. And holy cow, did I sell cars. I went from being flat broke to rolling in the money, which was really incredible. So the, we had a boss that was old style car dealership, but he was really into consultative sales, but he worked a lot. We all worked a lot, but he worked a ton. And one weekend we sent him home and said, we can't stand you anymore. You just have to go spend some time with your wife. And he had a lovely um, car salesman's wife. She was just absolutely perfect. And they had five children and living the dream. And when Dave came back to work, he was as big of a jerk as he had been before he left. And we're like, dude, what is going on? And he said, well, I'll tell you what happened. He said, on Friday, first day off, Patty made tuna sandwiches for lunch. And I said, oh, that's, that's nice. Okay. And he said, yeah, well, she didn't wash out the tuna cans before she put them in the garbage disposal or the um, trash compactor. I thought, okay. And he said, she didn't rinse them out. And so I explained to her why you have to rinse out tuna cans before you put them in the trash compactor. And then he said, and I realized that was a big mistake. <laughs> So she expounded on why he could rinse the tuna cans if he wanted those tuna cans rinsed. And they um, had a little battle over this. And the battle lasted the whole weekend. He slept on the couch the whole weekend. And on Monday morning, he realized that he had let a really little thing 
ruin the big things. And so I learned from him to always ask the question, is it just a tuna can? And could I rinse out the tuna can? And it was a really big lesson. It's one that I've taken into working with employees it is, you know, is this a tuna can? Am I making a mountain out of a molehill here? Am I letting this ruin what the really amazing thing is going on in the world? So um, I just want you to think about tuna cans next time you are um, dealing with a situation and wondering if it could be um, dealt with just a little bit better. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now, come back right to you. And the plan this morning, you guys, is that I'm going to talk a little bit, then we're going to hear from uh, Toby and Leslie, but all the way along, we want to hear from you. We want your questions. We want your feedback. That's what makes this this segment so incredibly juicy and good. We get to be honest here. So we're going to start with Leslie because she was the first one on this morning. Um, Leslie, uh, tell us your story. Tell us about being an employee. Tell us about managing employees. What do you want to tell us? Tell us who you are and what you're doing. My story. How far back do we go? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> to the good stuff. <laughs> to the good stuff. So I have an interesting, I have a bizarre career path. I started, um, I started my career as a collegiate volleyball coach and then moved into the nonprofit sector. From the nonprofit sector, moved into executive coaching and consulting. And I like to say that I landed, I've landed two dream jobs in a row. Um, so was loving what I was doing and, um, someone from first interstate had, or the chief human resource officer at the time at first interstate had reached out and said, Hey, we're looking at expanding what we're doing within our organization, looking at developing our leaders. Would you be interested? So not looking for a job, um, a three and a half ish years ago. And I've been at first interstate ever since and absolutely love what I get to do, developing people from our teller line all the way up to the 18th floor with our executive team and looking at how people interact. Um, how can we interact better together and how can we design the aspirational culture that we are moving towards? So that's a little bit about me. Oh my gosh, what a dream job, Leslie. Um, I, I admired that you get to do that ever since I've known you. I'm like, oh my gosh, she does have just a great job. Leslie, um, there's a book called um, It's the Manager, which um, all of you probably should read if you haven't. It's the Manager is a great book. Um, it's almost as good as the one that I can't think of the title of, I'll tell you in a minute. It's the Manager, there it is. Leslie, hold it up again so they can see that. Um, this book is so fantastic and it is always the manager, whether that's you or whether it's one of your people, it, it is always the manager. And in the book, it talks so much. Megan's going to hold her copy up too, right? There you go. <laughs> that's good. It is a popular book. I should just, you know, follow that author and work right behind him. Um, you guys, it talks about how in this modern world, people are looking for coaching. That is something that is so very, very important to people. And Leslie, I know Oh, that's what you're doing at First Interstate. So tell us a little bit about that. Tell us kind of your philosophy about coaching people and why you think that's important, not just there, but in the world. Why is that important? Coaching to me is about helping draw out insight from the person or the people that you are working with. It's about getting to deeper roots of issues, looking at what's number one what's being said and what's unsaid what are those what are those under the surface kinds of things that we don't talk about we talk a lot about emotional intelligence within our organization and just creating vocabulary around emotional intelligence because at the end of the day that's what's going to turn the tide in our organizational culture and make it a place that people don't want to leave um we want to we want to draw and attract great talent from across our from across our footprint. So as we think about my, my coaching philosophy is really about, about listening and the art of asking really good questions. So I'm constantly challenge, challenging both myself as well as our leaders is how can we, how can we ask better questions? Because better questions are going to lead to better answers and better answers lead to even more curiosity, which leads to great energy within the organization, as well as in, in your individual relationships too. Wow. And how hard has it been to um, teach people how to ask questions? Oh, ooh, hard. So that's a great question. 
I don't know, because it's part of when that, when the art of asking questions is hardwired, like you just do it and other people, other people kind of follow along. So essentially what we've done is we find, we find those great coaches within our organization who are catalysts. And we just get them around groups of people. And pretty soon you watch as these near neurons are, are, are taking off. You watch these leaders set the tone and the mood. So I don't know if hard is the right way of framing it. Um, I, I mean, sure, it, it's challenging when you're looking at building, when you're looking at building culture and when you're looking at building human beings and it's really about shifting mindset is that I would say that's what's been been harder is shifting the mindset from boss to coach from I tell you what to do I tell you how to do it I mean we've revamped everything from performance coaching to how we interact with each other in the in one-on-ones like taking the over engine we over engineer our performance um, systems in large organizations all the time but uh, taking that over engineering out of it and really teaching the art of presence and being with someone versus, okay, what's my checklist and what do I need to talk to you about here, here today? I think so you said so many things that I want to launch on, but I think that last thing is the very most important you guys, when you are talking with your employees, if you were with them, that is going to change culture that's going to help them want to stay. It's so beautiful, Leslie, that you want to have a culture where people don't want to leave. That's hugely important. I'm hiring for a position right now. And it's so interesting to me how many people want to leave the organization they're in. I'm like, you have a good job. You're earning good money. And they're like, oh, I got to get out. You don't want to be that culture. You want to be the culture where people want to stay. Yeah. And are you seeing that that's happening? Yes, slowly but surely as you you look at pockets and I'm responsible for all of employee engagement and managing and looking at like our culture and where our sure we have opportunities like any organization out there. But yes, I mean the people that I talk to it's like I don't I don't want to leave this place. But we still have opportunities to create career pathing for people to you know, right now I'm working on how do we not lose great, great talent um, and helping our people take control of their careers, being personally responsible, ending up somewhere on purpose versus ending up somewhere on accident. But I, I, yeah, we're seeing where people don't want, where they don't want to leave. At least that's what I'm hearing. I want to just follow along behind you and make a whole bunch of memes out of the words that you said, um, ending up somewhere on purpose. Wow, you guys. I hope that's why each of you are starting your businesses or sitting where you are in your career because you ended up there on purpose. I have not always ended up there on exact purpose. Usually I figured out after I got into the spot, but when you go on purpose and you make a decision because you checked with your gut and you checked with who you are and who you want to be in the world, you're going to do amazing things for the world. So I love that you're helping people to do that, Leslie. I'm going to share um, my screen again with you guys again. Uh, I have another screen here from um, Quiet Leadership. And this is a lesson I learned from my dad when I was a high paid business coach. And a few of you have heard this story I, um, because I love you and you have heard these stories. But um, it's worth retelling. And that is while I was coaching somebody, she earned my time and I had rather a big head at the time. And I was telling her what to do in her business instead of being with her, as Leslie pointed out, and just being in that moment with that person. And at the end of the call, I threw the phone down and I said, she's not freaking going to do what I said anyway. And because, you know, I could tell she wasn't listening to me. She wasn't taking it in. And my dad, who is a logger and who didn't have a whole lot of education, but certainly understood people. He said, now, Karen, which is always a good way to start a conversation with me. That's a great way to start. Um, I don't go Karen very often, but that one will get me. So dad said, now, Karen, people don't listen unless they ask to be told. And it was such a gut check moment for me when I realized that that's exactly what I had been doing. I told her what she needed to hear, but she hadn't asked me what, what I could help her with. She hadn't asked me for my wisdom. She wanted to tell me her story and what her problems were, and I just jumped in with the solutions. And so out of this came a process that is really simple. And that's why I'm putting it out to you guys. And the process is to ask three questions before you make a statement. 
this, I use this in sales situations. I use this in employee situations. I use this in speaking with my spouse. I never start that conversation with, what'd you do that for? That's not a good question to start with. But when you ask three questions before you make a statement, your person understands that you care about them, that you want to know where they're coming from, and that the, the statement that you're going to make is something that you have thought through and you know will help them. And so I'm just gonna encourage you to ask, ask some questions before you make a statement, even though you know exactly what the statement should be and what they should be doing, let them ask you for it first. So Karen, I I oh, to say, I've heard you say that before and look at this on my sticky note. I, I wrote that down a long time ago when you told me that before and I have it on my monitor because I think it's so important and awesome. And Megan, have you practiced it or is it just on the monitor? Uh, no, I definitely practiced it. It's right there front and center. And especially since most of my meetings are in Zoom as of late and it's incredibly helpful. Yeah, especially in Zoom. Don't you find if you ask a question, you get people actually engage in the call? For sure. Yeah. And have you learned things about people that you would not have guessed? I, yeah. And I think the other thing that, um, has helped me is when I, when I ask a question, I have to shut up afterwards and like let them answer it, you that's know? Almost, that's almost rude, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was going through, um, you know, training to be a teacher, um, the, the teacher who was teaching us how to teach uh, said, when you ask a question, wait, wait 10 seconds, just do it on your hand. And she's like, it's going to feel like a painfully long time, but eventually somebody's going to be so uncomfortable with the silence that they're going to decide to, to chime in. Um, but for people who are natural e extroverts or who enjoy engaging in meetings like this, um, typically we chime in before any of those other folks can even get the opportunity to gather their thoughts and speak up. So that's been big for me is asking the question and then zipping it. <laughs> so. So three and 10, that should be the process. Ask three questions, wait 10 seconds. Excellent, Megan, thank you for chiming in on that. Um, so I apologize, I'm training a new puppy how to behave and she, <laughs> She's also training me. It's going better for her than me. So sorry about the barking. I'm going to put her in the kennel now. Um, but Toby, I'd love for you to tell us your story. Tell us, go back as far as you want. Tell us what you're thinking at this point. Sure. Well, thank you. I, I took a lot of sticky notes myself. A lot of good stuff thus far this morning. So I'll stick those on my computer. But thank you. Great insights already. Uh, this is fun. Um, so yeah, my name's Toby O'Rourke. I'm the CEO at Campgrounds of America. So you may think that means I run the campground down on, on the river, but that's not the case. We actually, our headquarters for the company is here in Billings. So I get that confusion a lot. So a lot of people don't know we're here. We're actually a 60 year old company. Uh, you know, we have 400 and, or I'm sorry, 525 locations across the US and Canada. And we're the world's largest network of campgrounds. All started here in Billings and that's where we're still headquartered. So we employ, um, there's about 90 to 100 people here at the home office at the headquarters, but in totality across, you know, our properties. So of those 525, those are franchised properties primarily, but we own 35 of those parks. So at our parks, plus our field staff, we have about 1500 employees. So, so we're, you know, when I, we're talking about staffing and employees today, it could be everything from home office positions to, people at campgrounds that are, you know, working in the day to day. And we also help our franchisees staff their parks. We've got a really robust program we call Work Camper and that actually helps campgrounds um, find stuff. So kind of cover it on all levels and that that's what we're doing here at KOA. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything to, to add. Uh, I came to, to KOA 10 years ago, almost to the day. And my background prior to that was in marketing. So I came in the marketing side of the business and have come up in the organization and led operations before this. But at heart, I'm a marketer in that I used to market food products. And uh, before that was in software development. So I always like to say that I went from, you know, software to sausage to soy milk, because those were the products I marketed, to s'mores. And that, that's me in a nutshell. If you want to know about my career for those four words. Oh my gosh. So it was sausage, soy milk, 
What was that? So uh, the sausage, I didn't give a very good introduction. I apologize. I was a uh, brand manager for Hillshire Farm Smoked Sausage <laughs> right out of graduate school. And then I marketed silk soy milk, which you're probably all familiar with. So software to sausage to soy milk to s'mores is my career path. Wow. And tell us, um, that's funny, Claire says you ended with the best one. I agree. I feel very, very lucky to be able to work on such a fun brand that's getting people outside. So I love it here. Right. And tell us, as you have gone on this career tra trajectory, what do you find is true in every situation when you look at the employees of an organization? What's always true? You know, for me, it really comes down to passion about what you're working on. So I'm this type of person that will throw my whole being into, you know, whatever business I'm working on, and I become extremely passionate about it. So when, when I was marketing smoked sausage, like we ate a lot of smoked sausage, and I became really obsessed with it, which is kind of funny. And then all about plant-based nutrition when I was working um, for White Wave Foods and marketing soy milk and, and such. And now we're big campers and it's not just me, it extends to my entire family. So, and I think that's true of em good employees are super passionate about where they are. And I think if you don't have that passion for the business you're in, you're probably not at the right place. And I've made those decisions before to, to make a transition because I just didn't have the passion there. And, and if you can find people that really are passionate about what you do, they're going to be really good employees. You know, it's so incredible when I am called in to do team building with organizations, you guys, and they're, and they're in crisis. I like to be called in for fun, but when they're in crisis, it's almost always because they disconnected with their mission. And so when you're looking at starting your businesses, both Toby and Leslie are shaking their heads, yes, the disconnection mm -hmm. with mission is huge. And so as you're looking at starting your businesses, I can't understate how important it is to really zero in on that mission. Why are you doing what you're doing? And and why do you need people to help you with that? Now, a mission statement should not be three paragraphs long. It needs to be very simple, which I believe, Toby, you guys just developed a new mission a couple of years we ago. We did. I'm glad you teed that up. I'm just going to grab a thing to show you. Um, we spent, it took us a long time to frame what I call business architecture. I mean, I'm talking a couple of years. We did... We're, we're an old brand, we've been around a long time. Um, we had a mission statement. I didn't think it, it really captured the spirit of what we do here. And so we stepped back a few years ago and we did a lot of qualitative research, a lot of focus groups with franchisees, with employees at all levels of our organization, with people who camped with us and really tried to come out with those rich truths. And we developed, um, our brand architecture and this, and we do hire around people that share this architecture. So our mission statement is extremely simple. And I know you can't see this, but you know, I'm just trying to illustrate it's one line. Our mission statement is connecting people to the outdoors and each other. And we believe that every person in our organization, uh, whether you are a housekeeper cleaning a cabin to, to myself, is that's what I come to work for every day. We all come to work to connect people to each other and to the outdoors. And then we define values of our organization, which really drives our hiring, um, family oriented, passionate, entrepreneurial, customer focused and progressive. And we really try to hire people that share those ideals. And for example, this week we have franchisees in for our KOA university training. And I spend a lot of time on this on day one. And like, if you don't share this, that these values, you're probably not aligned with the right organization. And that's okay if you're not, um, but you probably need, we should make a change. So we try to make sure the people we hire, the franchisees we bring in, share those. And then I think the most powerful thing we did was develop belief statements. And I won't, you know, spend our time here today to read them all to you, but we developed five, six, seven, eight, eight, 10, maybe core belief statements, such as we believe relationships are strengthened by quality time outside together. We believe um, camping is fun and for everyone, you know, and that's really helped as we head into this world of diversity, equity, and inclusion, like that is a core belief. And, you know, we had that defined prior to building our initiatives. So I would just, you know, I would agree, everybody should define your mission, define your values. I love the belief statements. And then when people are interviewing with you or when you're trying to attract them, you have something to really show them, like, this is what it means to be a part of my company. And 
that hopefully that resonates with them. And if they don't, then it's probably not the right fit. So Toby, you again have said so many things that I love. Um, the rich truth was a beautiful statement. And I think we all know that about our businesses, our rich truths. What we're doing and what that means to the world is a rich truth. And so I'd love for you to take just a moment, you guys, and go into chat and tell us what your business is or a rich truth about your business. So tell us your mission statement, um, or if you don't have that, tell us just a rich truth. Um, I appreciate doing that. Uh, and Claire says, is this the same standard we can use for independent contractors? Absolutely. Independent contractors are people who are representing your business and they absolutely have to have the same core values as you do. And they have to, I think, even more understand what that mission is and how important that is to carry forward. So Leslie, or pardon me, Toby, I want to um, ask you a question and we'll, then we'll come back into what you guys are putting in chat. But when you're talking to your franchisees and you're talking to them about hiring people, is there a question or a couple of questions that you have found help in the hiring process to help them understand what they're looking for in employees? Oh, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Um, I, I don't know if I've framed it as a question, but I always, you know, think that you want to hire people who are treated as if it's their own business. And so maybe empowering them in their questions, like what would you do if this was your business? And I, we're doing a, annual reviews right now. And we ask every person that works for us, it's like, what, if you own this company, what would, what would you do? And, um, and I think that's a really great question to ask somebody, you know, if this was your campground or if this, you know, it could be one of my marketers, like, what should I be thinking about? or what would you be doing if you were the CEO of this company or the owner of this store or owner of this campground? Because they're giving people the floor and the, uh, the ability to give you the feedback. And maybe it's post hiring. I always like to do a 30 day uh, sit down with a new, and, and maybe it depends on the level of employee, maybe it's 90 days and saying, I, I just want time to hear your feedback on our company. And what would you do differently? Wide open feedback. And when you asked our best boss, I had put down a woman named Val and that's what she did with me. About 60 days in, she's just like, I'm setting up time, this isn't about you. I just want feedback from your outside perspective. What would you do differently here? And I really like to hire people. I like to promote from within. I really love to hire new blood in also because new perspectives totally changes us for the better. So I wanna sit down and give them the floor. And it doesn't matter what level of the organization it is, I wanna hear what feedback they have. And, and I, I think anyone could do that in any business. It would make it stronger. It absolutely can. And you've given me a moment to launch. I'm always so excited about that, Toby. But <laughs> I love that you are capable or that you're confident enough to say, what would you do with this organization, both in the, in the beginning and after 30 or 90 days? That takes confidence, you guys, to have somebody say, here's where you're messing up. Here's where your opportunities are. But when you are confident enough to do that, you absolutely are going to grow your business stronger, faster, bigger. So Toby, three cheers for that. It's so important to do that. Um, the, the place where I'm going to go here just a little bit, you guys, is when you were hiring employees, or you're recruiting for a direct sales team, because we've had several people on direct sales on these calls. I like to tell you that hiring employees is a little bit like um, playing with Russian dolls. You all know Matrushka dolls, right? So Matrushka dolls, here's how this fits in. I have to show you one that has um, Tigger on it. It's not the really pretty face, a little Tigger, but this one came from Russia. I'm sure it's a licensed project uh, or product. It is not. Um, but when you're looking at Matrushka dolls, the thing about a Matrushka doll is that there are dolls inside of dolls inside of dolls. And eventually you get down somewhere in there, you get down to the very smallest doll and there no longer is Tigger and Winnie the Pooh on here. All of a sudden there's just this little balloon. There's just this little something. Now, the reason this is important is if you are if you think of yourself as the big outside Matrushka doll and your hair looks good and your lipstick's on and the apron's nice and straight and you only hire people 
who can learn from you. So who are that little interior doll? They're maybe, maybe their hair doesn't look good all of the time. Maybe they don't know as much as you do about the business and you just keep hiring smaller and smaller people. So if I hire somebody whose apron is crooked and that person hires somebody whose apron is crooked and lipstick is crooked, uh, eventually you end up with the person who's just a balloon and easy to pop and maybe not doing a whole lot for your organization. But when you are brave enough to be the middle doll where things are going okay, but you know, you still, you have your days where it's a little bit of a shit show. If you can hire people who are better than you and who make you think, which is what Toby is working on. If you hire people who make you think and make you bigger, you are going to do amazing things in your business. And if you hire people who are that little inside matrushka doll that need help in the world, you get to help them and you have a whole organization of people who can help them. And you're going to give them a job perhaps when nobody else could. So I'd love for you to think about yourself as the middle matrushka doll when you're hiring. Hire people you can learn from, hire people that you can teach. And that's gonna help you grow a lot further, a lot faster. So that was my lecture off of your speech there, Toby. Thank you for giving me a launch. That was nice, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> no, I, I would agree with you completely. Um, I think I, I've noticed in my career and I notice it in different people's levels of their career. And, and I'm sure Leslie sees this. It's a big confidence change when you move from people to thinking they have to know all the answers and do all the work. And I've been there. I've been that person, like I need to do it all. And, then, and I'm always in this prove mode to where I really strive to be now to be like, I need people that know a lot about things I don't know about and I can't do it. And I step back out of it. And um, I'm always trying to coach my team about you need to get really good people around you so that you can step up here and do some strategic work, you know, like always building your base. And I think it's, it's, it's shifted my, once I could get my head that direction, um, it, it allowed me, my career to propel forward. Yeah, it's scary at first, isn't it, Toby? Yeah, it can be, but it makes your business, you know, I understand I'm not an entrepreneur. I work in a company, but it was my own business. It would be the exact same thing. I would think coming from a family of entrepreneurs, you think you have to know it all and do it all, but hire people that know, in, empower them and step back and you'll just, you'll be able to focus on other things and your business will get bigger and bigger. Exactly right, which is why we wanted you on here, Toby, because you know that also, because um, I want people to have the vision that KOA was started in Billings, Montana. It is a huge company that makes a huge difference in people's lives. And so you guys, when you're thinking about your business, you don't have to just think small. You don't have to just think, I'm going to take care of Billings, Montana. You can expand outside of here. This is a great place to launch a business. Leslie, I've seen you shaking your head a lot. Do you have any things here that you want to launch on, add into here? Yeah, well, I was just, I was looking at a question that Claire had posed in the chat over here. Um, I want to hear more about, can you tell me more about that question, Claire? I want to hear just a little bit more. So I have some thoughts on it, I think. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I, I think, you know, I've been on other, I guess, meetings or, or other learning opportunities and people have said specifically, um, you know, you can't, you can't expect other people to know what you want if you haven't done it. So the example that comes to mind is like, let's say social media marketing, right? If you don't know what you want your message to be and, and how you want it to look and, and all the details, you can't, um, you can't necessarily have the confidence to let somebody else take charge of that because it's it's still sort of yours, right? Um, so I think what they were trying to get at is you need to know a lot of those those little pieces to start with, take ownership of that, and then once you've kind of gotten you know taken all those steps yourself, then you can put it out there to say, okay, now I want to hire somebody because I know what I'm looking for, I know that person I'm looking for, I know what I want to get out of it, and who I'm going to work best with. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Yes. And because there's also these pieces and Toby, I don't, I would imagine you experienced this too, is the CEO, you can't know, 
you don't know every single nuanced thing that everybody that rolls up into you. So I think it's this sense of having a sense of curiosity, knowing enough about what it is, you know, hey, here's your, you've got the strategic initiatives that you're, resp you're fully responsible for everything. So it's, it's knowing enough, but you don't have to be all the way down in the weeds into, into the details, but knowing enough of who and how you need to be hiring. And that idea back to what you guys were talking about earlier, Karen, hiring those people around you, surrounding yourself with really good people. One of the things we've been thinking a lot about in our organization is just building this sense of curiosity in our people. Our CEO talks so much about curiosity about, okay, if you can't find, if you can't find the answer, how else can you think about it? Who else can you network with? Who can you learn from? I heard once, um, well, once it was actually 10 years ago, maybe it was even 10 years ago today, I was in Europe in a cab and a man named John Smith said, you know what, you can even learn from the village idiot. So being in creating the sense of learning and the sense of curiosity that we have, like there's things that we can learn from people, even in an interview process, if that person's not going to be your hire, there's still something that you can learn from them. Even if it's one thing that, um, and I imagine Toby, you get this too, but there's that like, there's that feeling that you get when you are interviewing someone, like it either clicks or it doesn't, like your body tells you what's going on. And I, there, I have made some hiring mistakes in, in my tenure and I'm like, man, I really should listen to my body. Like that fell off and ended up having to have crucial conversations and make hard decisions as, as a result. So getting curious about, I mean, ourselves and how we show up, but also the person sitting across from us too. And I would build on that. Um, the uh, Another thing on the opposite side of that, I have hired people that I didn't have a position for, that I had such a connection with and knew they were going to do big things and knew they, you know, I didn't know exactly what they were going to do yet, but I was like, I have to snatch up good people. I get yeah. them in the door and eventually they've worked. I, I created, I take a lot of time to concept positions and think about it. I mean, I could take me a long, long time. But there's been a couple people I'm like, just just roll with me. Just know this is going to be great. Might just be doing some project work to start. And now they're in really meaningful roles, which is exactly what they needed to be doing for organizations. So I agree. I've made wrong decisions a couple times, but a lot of times good gut feel on good people. Even if you don't have something open at the moment, I would snatch them and then it'll it'll work its way out. Yes, I love, I love that you do that. That's uh, that you have the, the ability to, to do that. It, sometimes we have, and it's worked out great. Like for example, um, probably the biggest success story, another woman. So it's a great one to bring up. A young woman interviewed for a communications role I had open about eight years ago. When she came in, I just, I knew that wasn't probably going to be her strongest suit, but I just had the gut that like she needed to be at this organization. And today she's our chief marketing officer. And that was eight years ago. And she came in and it was someone I just, I said, let's try this right now. Let me craft something for you. And over time it's grown and molded and changed. And now she's a very senior executive here and she's, she's young and ambitious and invested in herself. Invest, I've invested in her training and development and it worked out great. And we just brought another person in similar situation. It, you asked a question about independent contractors. Sometimes even maybe you don't have the ability to hire somebody, but maybe you could develop a short, a small contract with somebody just to keep them close to your organization. And I, I said, you know, I don't have space in my budgets to hire right now, but I would like to keep connected and see what develops. And we developed a contract. And so we're paying them. They're an independent contractor for us right now, but I think it will grow into something more. There's that it factor that you're talking about that you can't, you can't teach that. You, it, it, we're trying and it takes four times the amount of time than someone who comes in and they've just got it and you're like, hey, hold on, I've got something for you. I don't know what that something is, but, but hang on for the ride and it'll come. I love that. Yeah, the it factor is absolutely huge, you guys. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'm going to go, there's two things here that I want to talk about just a little bit. The first one is um, Toby's point that you have to hire by your gut. It's the it factor. When you guys are looking at starting your businesses or starting hiring in your businesses, which you're probably ready to hire before you think you are, um, trust your gut. And if there's something about that person, you're like, I just don't know, don't hire them. Because if you just don't know, 
you're going to find out right away. So hire slow and then fire fast, which is harder to do in big organizations, but in little organizations, you can fire fast. If they're not the right fit, get them out the door, help them find something else if that's in your heart, but don't let them take your organization down. The other thing that I want to say about that is that um, when you're trusting your gut, sometimes your gut is like, dang, I'm going to hire this person. And you have a trusted confidant who says, don't hire this person. Um, listen to that, because a lot of times they have insights that you don't understand. Uh, a small example of that is one of the people that I'm coaching right now um, said, hey, I'm thinking of hiring this person. And I was like, so I could, couldn't obviously tell her everything I know, but I said, just proceed with caution. And um, now one month into that situation, she he has to fire that person and because uh, she didn't listen to the coach she's paying a lot of money for and I picked on her about that just a little so trust other people in your circle because sometimes they know they you have to trust their guts too the uh, other thing that I wanted to um, touch base on here just a little bit is what Leslie said and that is that sense of curiosity when I'm doing collaborative art with people, you guys, I see this a lot. I see people who are curious enough to put that paintbrush on the canvas, even though they don't know anything about what they're going to do or what it's going to look like. And they're just curious and like, well, let's just see where this goes. Those are the people who become great leaders in the organization. And when it's a whole organization where the whole organization is like, I'll put the paintbrush on the canvas. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm just going to trust you. We're going to be curious about where this goes. Those are the organizations that are moving fast and that solve big problems really quickly. So one way that I think that you can keep your sense of curiosity alive, it sounds so simple, but it is just go for a wow walk. And a wow walk is going out into the world and just saying, wow, I never saw a tree that looks like that. Or wow, look at those clouds. And just reminding yourself that there are things in the world that are absolute wonders. I love to take teams for wow walks um, and then have them come back and say, this is what I saw. This is what was amazing out there. And just taking that moment in nature and developing that sense of curiosity about, wow, what is that? Or wow, how did that get there? Really helps to grow your team. The other thing that you can do to keep a sense of curiosity going is change. Change your toothpaste once in a while, change where you're sitting. I can't tell you how many times I have gone into an organization and flipped the, um, the conference room table uh, or taken the chairs out of the room and people are like, oh, I don't know what to do now. But when you do that, when you develop that, oh my gosh moment, people get curious about how they can have conversations and curious about how they can solve problems. So keep that sense of curiosity alive in your organizations and that's going to help you to drive your businesses much further, much faster. So I'm, you know, I want to give you guys time to ask questions if you have that, but I also want to make sure that you looked at the um, mission statements that everybody put in the chat box. These are so, so beautiful. Um, I, Megan, I love money matters to everyone and everyone matters to us. Simple language. Anybody can understand it and they know that you care about them. Um, Tanya, um, empowering women daily to love and appreciate themselves just the way they are today. Wow, wow, wow. I wrote an article for Yellowstone Valley Women not too long ago um, about buying a fancy bra, and it was all about going to TLC lingerie, and everybody should go there and buy a nice bra if you haven't. Uh, Denise, Denise's, um, of course, touches my heart because I want her to find her next. That's my mission in life, helping using my positivity to help individuals and teams to find their next. Um, graphic finesse, build business, simple, pure, so beautiful. Um, Cobalt Collective, to provide comprehensive design solutions with a flexible, reliable, and collaborative service you can trust. Beautiful. Okay, so you guys, that is great. You want to know my answer about should you know every position? I think you should, Claire, know everything that's going on in your organization, but then I think you also very quickly have to move out of doing everything in your organization. So you should know what it's like to keep the books. You should know what it's like to clean the floor, but you shouldn't do that forever. You should move out of that as fast as possible. And we can talk about that more when we jump on the phone um, in the next day or so there. And we, uh, we always say that as well. Um, if your strong suit isn't bookkeeping, then hiring a CPA is the best thing for you because you'll spend a lot of time and effort. And when you're an entrepreneur, your time is your money. 
And so you'll spend a lot of time on something that's not your strong suit. And then, you know, in the end, you may end up having to have someone look through it anyway. So it's just better to have, have focus on your strengths and then let your, you know, your weak areas be focused on by people who, who have those at their strengths. So it's okay. Um, have an, a general understanding of them, but it's okay to, to, to reach out to other people who are experts in those fields. Great. Thank you for that point, Kayla. Very, very good. Yeah. Um, especially money. You should know how to know if somebody's uh, taking advantage of your books, but you should not be doing your books. Um, questions. Who has a question for our speakers? Anybody want to pop off and or pop off mute and ask a question? No question. Well, yeah, yeah, please. Um, so we reached a point in our business where we probably should hire something like uh, you know, it's just, how do you decide, I guess, which role, you know, there's multiple roles we could hire for. Does anybody have any blanket, like, advice on which role to find you should hire first? Leslie, it looks like you had an idea. Do you? A couple of thoughts where you could, I, because you're an entrepreneur, you can pilot test things. You don't have to go through the same horrendous, not horrendous, but um, <laughs> lots of steps that Toby and I have to go through in order to hire people to be with, you know, legalities and all of those things. So I wonder if you could pilot test some things. What if you did an internship just to, to see, okay, what could this person come and fill? Because what we're learning with talent is sometimes we get talent and they come in and meet a need that we didn't even know was there. I have a current, um, our current administrative assistant is meeting needs that I'm like, oh my goodness, you are a breath of fresh air. I didn't know that I needed that. So hiring that type of mindset where whether it's a young college student or somebody who's looking to get back into the workforce, I think about a I mean, what a great opportunity to be hiring women. Is there is there a young woman out there who's been, you know, impacted by COVID or had to stay home with kiddos? So thinking outside of the box, I would also think about this concept of what I like to call open system stance. Who else, who else do we know? So tapping into your network, whether you're using your social media platform, hey, do you guys know of anybody who's just looking to get some experience using the colleges for networking opportunities as well. When we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, are there areas you can tap into their resources, which I'm sure Kayla, they could connect you, um, you know, the veterans with um, the programs that you have, that you have there. So just, I would think outside of the box. Um, those are just a few ideas that, that come to mind. So I'm sure Toby, you would have things to add to that conversation from your experience. Yeah, my advice was going to be um, looking at your your you and your role and be and you know you have to spend some time with it but think if I put more of my time in doing this it's going to advance my company advance my business and then hire someone to fill a gap to take some other things off your plate so think about where you need to put your time to really make an impact and then make sure you can put as much of your time to that activity as possible so you might need someone to help hire to help um allow you to do that. I wonder if you even did like a love it, loathe it list. Like when Kayla was talking about <laughs> the book, you guys, I have stories. My husband's an entrepreneur and I was responsible for doing the books and I literally melt into a puddle every tax season. It makes me want to cry. I'm watching like tax courses, learning how to do taxes on LinkedIn learning right now. And I'm like, I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to be a CPA. My brain doesn't think that way. So maybe starting there too, to Toby's point of like, what are the things that you hate doing? If I were an entrepreneur, I, that was the first thing that I would hire out. And that is the, the last thing that we have hired out. It's probably the dumbest business, business decision that we make. So I'm sure we left money on the table somewhere or there's I did something wrong. The IRS is going to hunt me down at some point in time because I screwed something up because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, just, ladies. Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Okay, great. So I saw here, um, Claire, you said um, about using Upwork or Fiverr or something similar. So what I am finding right now, a lot of my clients are having huge success with virtual assistants. Um, I love Fiverr. Oh my gosh, I've gotten so many great things done really fast on Fiverr um, and Upwork. I think those are good stopgap measures. 
I don't think that they're necessarily good long-term solutions. If you have a long-term vision with your business, you should develop relationships with contractors who can help you, with employees who can help you. But yeah, they're a great way, especially when funds are still tight in the beginning. That's a great place to start. Okay, Kayla, handle the next question, please. Kelsey says, write yourself a job description with no commas, drilling in the very core of what you bring to the table, strengths and what you like to do. Then the job tasks that don't align with your, don't align with your job description need support staff. Kelsey, that's on point. Um, I don't know if Leslie or Toby want to pop in there, but I would completely agree. I think that goes along with the love it or hate it list. Um, you know, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Mm -hmm. We always say, in a business standpoint, your SWOT analysis, which is, you know, your strengths and your weaknesses that you're just anal uh, analyzing it. So I think that's really important when you're doing that is, you know, what are the tasks that you're good at taking care of? Um, you know, that could be like in Toby, she's like, I used to be in marketing. I have a really good knowledge in marketing. That's a really big, strong suit of hers, but, and software. Um, so she knows the software end of things. So those might be two really big things, but she may not, not know anything about like building a cabin on a campsite. So, you know, for her, she'd be like, well, we definitely need someone who's going to be doing that um, because I don't know that. So I think that's important. Uh, I think that right there is a perfect description of, of uh, a great way to decide how you're going to do what you're going to do and what you need to find somebody to help you with. Yeah, and even when you know how to do everything, like if you are a one person show or you're, you know, the manager of a department or whatever, and you, like I've found myself in past positions where I can do the operations and the ordering and the, you know, the shipping, the LTLs, but I'm also stylizing the floor and helping people design kitchens. Like I'm literally doing everything and I don't really mind doing everything and I like all those different things, but I just, I can't handle it all. So I had to really drill down like where I added the most value and where my time was, you know, should be spent and then figuring out what kind of support staff could come in to delegate the things that I don't really need to be doing or should be doing, which is basically what everybody's been saying. <laughs> so, but. Always good to clarify, Kelsey. Thank you. <laughs> so much. You guys, this has been um, a really good call. I've learned some things. Um, I appreciate all of the insights, all of the questions. Toby and Leslie, I know you are busy women. We definitely appreciate your jumping on here today and helping give these entrepreneurs a vision of who they can be and what they can do. So thank you very much for your time. Well, this was fun. Thank you. I learned a lot. Good, good, good. All right, you guys go out and have an amazing day. Make some money, build a good business, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks.